There we go. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, obviously, a big thank you to Stephen Luger, our guest presenter this evening. Um, he's going to be chatting a little bit more in depth about rip currents and a whole lot more behind. I'm not going to give too much away. I'll leave that for Stephen. Um, Stephen, you're online, sir. Uh, yes. Good evening. Ah, there we go. Evening, Stephen. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, before we get going, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm a coastal engineer. I've been specializing in, in coastal modeling. So we use computer programs to, to simulate coastal processes really used to then design um, harbors and uh, beach nourishment schemes and water quality and marine outfalls um, and vessel motions, things like that. And yeah, so I've, I've been doing that for about t more than 20 years now. And wow. it's, I uh, work for a company called PRDW, which are uh, consulting, consulting engineers. So we just specialize in, and it's a, it's a fairly, um, you know, we, you can use the same principles around the world. So we, we, we're doing projects um, in a number of places um, because the wave is a wave. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't get language. It doesn't have a law of that country. The, the law of the, you know, the waves just behave the same. No matter where you go, there are some weird things out there. In some countries there's ice and in, other countries there's tsunamis and other countries there's tropical cyclones or mud but um in, in it's it's all the same uh, processes that are, are happening awesome well i think it's going to be very interesting um and i'm going to hand over to you sir so you can share your screen and um we will wait intently and if there's any questions guys as always pop them in the chat section on the side or just raise your hand and uh I'll ask you to come on and you can switch on your mic and then we'll on, have some questions to ask you, Stephen. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the topic is of waves, currents and tides. And um, just getting on the right screen here. So really what I want to do is, is we've run all these models in for different studies and uh, we can use the, the output of the models in the form of images and animations to, to just demonstrate some of these processes that are going on. And I've, I've extracted some from projects that we've done. Uh, I think will be of interest to um, see rescue. So the topics, we, I'll give a very brief introduction to the models that we're using. And then the real topics are, are waves, then currents, then tides, and storm surge, wave run-up, rip currents. Uh, and then the, the last few topics are sort of less directly applicable and more out of interest um, would be tsunamis and oil spills. And I originally had it talking about tropical cyclones and sewage plumes. And, and you know desalination brine plumes. Uh, I realized I probably don't have enough time to talk about those, but I, I do have those slides presentation. So I think at the end, if there's any specific interest in in any of those things, I, I can I can talk briefly to them. Um, the projects that, that I'm going to show tonight, um, you know, we are, are from studies we've done at at various places, shown as these these red dots in the diagram here. So pretty much Abu Dhabi. So um, like I said, they, they, the processes are all the same. So they are applicable uh, in South Africa. OK, so to start off with the, the models, so we use a, modeling, a model called Mike. It comes from Denmark. And um, it's, it's actually a whole lot of models or modules that, that fit together. And it allows us to model a whole range of processes from waves. Within wave modeling, you, you can model waves in different ways, depending. The same with sediment. 
the same with hydrodynamics and the same with water quality. So it's essentially a whole toolbox that, that you have uh, which you can then apply and you'll see the examples later on. And just to just to emphasize, I mean, the, these are sort of professional engineering software, so it, it's not just fancy graphics. There is some some science behind the results that you're seeing, and um, and and they are based on on physics. So for the equation, but just to mention that you know, behind the pictures there are these equations. This is a simple. This is simply saying that if you have a body of water. It's going to move depending on the forces that are that are put onto it. So the force due to the wind, the force due to the waves, the force due to the Earth's rotation, the force due to the tide. So so that's what's what's behind the model. And then in order to cover those equations, you need to divide the area of interest, your domain, up into these elements. So if you recognize this, this is the Cape Peninsula. Table Bay here, and you can see how we've divided this domain up into these triangles and rectangles. And then if we want to simulate in 3D, we actually then have a number of layers you can see at the bottom here. So we've we've divided it up into layers. Okay, so that that's just very briefly how the models work. And again, a model is a model, so we, we spend a lot of time validating the models against observations and one of the instruments we use is called an acoustic Doppler current profiler. It, it's like this, so it's an instrument that can be mounted on the seat and it has these four beams that point upwards and we can use that to measure currents um, and, and the currents at different levels, at different depths. We can also measure waves, we can also measure water levels in that instrument. Um, we're also using uh, satellite measurements. So satellites at the moment are capable of measuring wave height. They can't measure wave direction or wave period, but they can measure the water roughness, and from that they can uh, they can calculate the wave height. So we can get wave. We can also get water level tidals from satellites. You can also get sea surface temperature. You can get um, algae, phytoplankton in the sea, uh, the water clarity. Those are all um, parameters that you can measure nowadays with with satellites. And then this, this plot on the top right here is just showing a comparison between an observation shown in red and the modeled results shown in blue. So it's actually a, a, a tidal currents. And you can see the over this is over seven days. So we started off in tide and you can see how the, the current is changing. That's the speed and the, underneath is the direction. And down the bottom here is a different, just a different way of presenting currents is a rose where you, you actually plot the direction that the current is going. Um, and then you plot the, the colors are showing the speed and the, 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 the sort of uh, blocks on the currents of that speed. And again, comparing the model to the measurements, you can see there's, there's a good correlation. And the last slide on, on verification, red plot. So we just plot the wave height measured versus the wave height modeled. And what you can see here is that it's it's not a one to exactly a one to one line. And, and that's typically we you know we're not able to simulate exactly what's happening. There is some scatter around our answer. But you can see that in general, in this case, um, the trend is very good. And provided you understand the limitations of the models and, and the expected accuracy, they are very useful tools. Okay, so that's introduction. So the first place we're going to go to is the Seychelles. Um, on the left here, this is a, an island called Eden Island. It's a completely man-made island, and we've done a lot of coast. We've done all the coastal engineering that was needed uh, for this island. And the area here shown in the red, in the red rectangle is one of the yacht basins. So you can see there are these finger jetties, and the yachts are moored up against the jetty and they were experiencing excessive waves um, and ex which were, were damaging those vessels. Um, now these owners here are they, they can afford these these fancy yachts but they don't necessarily know how to moor them properly so they were complaining about the yachts getting damaged. So the best way to approach that is, is to set up a model. So on the right hand side here you see we've set up a model of this um, basin. Uh, is the animation coming across okay? 
Yes, Stephen, 100%. Thank you. Perfect. So what you're seeing here are the um, coming into the marina um, and then they're refracting or diffracting around the breakwater. They're reflecting off the revetment here. And you can see once they get inside the marina, they're just bouncing around because it's approximately a square basin with vertical walls. So the waves are bouncing around and this was basically making the waves too big. And so the question is how to reduce the waves. And we, 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 with the model, you're able to very quickly test different options. And we tested a, a large number of options. And the, the obvious one is just reduce the, you know, close off the entrance, but you have to allow navigation into the, into the, into the port. And actually the most obvious was closing off the entrance um, on this side actually made things worse because it allowed some energy in, but it, it reduced the energy coming in, but it actually reflected the energy and, and trapped it inside the port. So, so those are the kind of problems that you can get if you don't study the problem properly. Um, on this slide, what we're showing is the existing situation. So with the existing situation, the wave heights inside the marina was about 0.2 meters. And the solution that we implemented are these just these two little red wave screens. And you can see that that reduced the wave height to 0.1 meters. And it was a relatively cheap solution. You can still navigate into the harbor. And um, we weren't able to extend these breakwaters offshore because it's a man-made island. It's extremely deep offshore. It's all, a re it's all reclaimed land. So um, it's very expensive. To so that's a, a simple example of, of using these models to, to design a, a, a marina. Maybe just a, a little bit of theory. Um, if you look at, at waves, um, this diagram on the top left here is on the bottom, on the x-axis is showing um, the wave period and the black line is showing the kind of amount of energy that exists at these different periods. And if you look at between one second and 30 seconds, normal waves that we, we see when we, you know, that we all experience, they are technically called gravity waves because they, all these waves are caused by the wind, but it's, they're actually the, what causes the wave to move is gravity. So they're called gravity waves. Um, if we go a little bit further along, between 30 seconds and five minutes, you get waves called infragravity waves. And maybe the most simple example of that is is this um, the sort of uh, urban legend or whatever you want to call it that that every set wave. And if you if you have a 14 second swell running, um, for, and every second every seventh wave would be about every hundred seconds. And and that is is that is the that is really what generates this energy in the between uh, 30 minutes and five minutes. It's it's the groups of waves. It's the, the variation in the wave heights. And, and those are called infragravity waves because they travel on top of the gravity waves. And then just moving on between uh, five minutes and, and, and 12 hours, we have um, essentially storm surge, which are caused by um, pressure and wind. And also we have uh, tsunamis ca caused by earthquakes. And I will be discussing later on both uh, storm surge and tsunamis. And then you see we've got this big blip in energy at 12 hours, and that's that's the tide. So that's the effect of the sun and the moon on the tides. And then there's another blip at 24 hours, which is also tidal, which is the, the effect of other planets on the tides. So that's just a, an overview of what exists at all these different periods. And on the right-hand side here is an example. It comes from a place called Chiang Kai in Peru where we're busy designing a port. So this is the port that we've designed. And if we play the simulation, on the top plot is just a normal swell. So that would be your 14 second swell uh, coming in and then moving behind the breakwater here to the berths would be over here. The issue is with, with these very large vessels like these ore carriers that they're going to use, that they're going to be harbor. They're so long that they, they don't really feel the 14 second waves because they're longer than the wavelength. So they don't even move with a 14 second wave. What causes them to move is these infragravity waves. So at the bottom plot, we've just filtered out the energy between five, uh, between 
30 seconds and five minutes. And that's what you're seeing in the bottom plot. And you can see the wave heights are quite a lot smaller. But, um, this is actually the energy that's of interest um, for these big vessels. And if you look at you can see there's a lot of this energy in the surf zone as well. And and this would also impact, it doesn't cause rip currents or drive rip currents, but it, it would modulate rip, rip currents. So you, you, when you get a, a set wave coming in, you would see that the, the, the rip current gets a bit stronger. And, and that's what you're seeing in this plot is is these, these longer period waves. Um, these ones would be have about a period of about 100 seconds. Okay, so that was Peru. Are we going to Durban? Uh, so this is um, Durban. This is the entrance to the port. Um, and we've done studies over here around Vecchi's Pier. So Vecchi's Pier is over here. This is the, north, the beachfront. Um, this is the bathymetry. So you can see Vecchi's Pier there goes to just below sea level. And it's actually a, a, an old pier that it's a man-made structure that was built, I think, in the beginning of the last century, essentially as a pier to, to try to improve the navigation of the port in those days. Um, but now it's, it's pretty much a, a submerged uh, rock structure. And um, what we've done is model the waves. So in the bottom left-hand plot, we are showing um, a wave, results of a wave model. So the colors are showing the wave heights. Hot colors are big waves and cold colors are small waves. So you see the waves coming in from the southwest and then they're breaking on Vecchi's reef. So just as you can see in the in the Google image over here, the waves are breaking on the reef. So they're getting a lot smaller. Um, they're also breaking in the surf zone here and you can see them getting smaller and smaller. So then what we can do is use the model to calculate the currents that are generated by those waves. And that's shown in the bottom right-hand plot. So the first thing to see is just because these waves over here are breaking at an angle to the beach, they're driving a current northwards up the coast. And that's the current that occurs generally along the KZN coast. And it's responsible for moving sand northwards along the coast. Half a million cubic meters of sand is moving northwards along the coast, um, and that's why we at the at the entrance here we need to have dredging and bypass the sand and put it back onto the beaches. Otherwise, the beaches would disappear, and the port would get um, the the port entrance would get would get um, completely um, uh, blocked up with sand. But the interesting thing about the currents is they often then generate strong currents on top of veggies. But then they generate this rip current that goes out against the pier. The reason it goes in this direction is, is that as the waves break here, they actually lift up the water level a little bit. And that, that, ex that excess water has to escape somewhere. And it, it doesn't really escape to the north because there's also wave breaking to the north. So the water level here is actually even higher. So it doesn't go that way. But if it goes th on this side, there is less wave breaking. You can see over here. So it finds the easiest route out, and that is to flow out along the pier. And for this, in this particular case, we get about a half current running out along the pier. So that's um, some currents at, at Durban. If we go to Cape Town, um, this is again showing waves at Cape Town. The, they have, it's exactly the same wave height and period offshore. It's a half, five and a half meter wave with a period of 12 and a half seconds offshore. But the left hand plot is, is more southwesterly wave condition, the more dominant wave condition. And the, the plot on the right hand side is a much more westerly wave condition. Uh, and um, what you can see in the normal condition, um, a five and a half meter wave offshore. In the middle of Table Bay, the wave height is reduced to two meters. And that's the effect of wave refraction, the way the waves um, bend as they enter to try to align themselves um, with the contours. And that in that way, they, it the energy gets spread out and the wave height reduces. So you can also see very much shelter around the port of Cape Town, which is the reason the port is built there in the first place. You can also see shelter and drop. In the case, and you see also even Melkbos is sheltered um, by Robben Island and even by 
essentially by Hot Bay, by the Cape Peninsula, provide some shelter to milk boss under these conditions. In the westerly, though, you can see the waves come straight in. There's no refraction, so that five meter wave is almost five meters just offshore milk boss. So there's a big, the same white wave height offshore can cause very different waves near shore. Another interesting thing is the way the waves move around Robben Island. You can see here the to the south of Robben Island and also to the north of Robben Island. And if we if we look at a Google image and an enhanced Google image, um, we can see this red line is showing the wave crests of the waves that refracted around the north of Robben Island. And the blue crests are showing waves that refracted around the south of Robben Island. And the people that know this area, um, Dadastian and, and these, these spots along here, the, the waves often have these sort of quite um, complicated patterns and little peaks caused then by the interaction of these two wave trends that have moved, uh, refracted around Robben Island. Yeah, so if we then zoom in into Big Bay, so this is Big Bay here, you can see the, see the surf, uh, surf rescue uh, building over here. Um, Big Bay, this is the bathymetry. It has this island offshore. Um, it has this other island over here, which creates a tombola, which is this this um, the sand spit that goes on this side. It's got a what's called a salient, which is a, a sort of submerged tombola. Like I said before, to to solve this numerically, we need to divide it into a grid. So the grid that we're using is 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 shown over here. You can see it's quite fine because the comp the processes are quite complicated. So this plot on the left is showing the waves as they, that same wave we saw in the beginning from the southwest, but this is just zooming in and showing once as it gets into Big Bay. So it comes in, it refracts around the islands and it breaks. On the right hand plot is showing the waves that are generated condition. Uh, sorry, the currents that are generated by this wave condition. And you can see they're really complicated. Um, there are these, these eddies here, there's like a rip current here. Um, flowing offshore, another eddy over here. And again, it's, it's just because these, these currents are, are relatively complicated because of the islands, because of the shape of the bathymetry, it generates um, these complicated patterns. Um, in small bay even, there are these patterns. So that is the, the more the southwesterly wave. If we move to the westerly wave condition, you can see the currents are very different. And in general, there's quite a strong southward current coming into the bay. And then also like a rip flowing out um, against the, the southern island. So as the wave conditions change, the, the currents change. Um, so that is Big Bay. Um, we've also modeled Camps Bay recently. So this is just for one wave condition at Camps Bay, showing the waves coming in southwesterly swell. So the waves in Camps Bay are quite small. Um, this is Clifton over here. You can see Clifton Forth, uh, very sheltered and a little bit more exposed as you go to Clifton First. Um, and then on the, the right hand side here is the corresponding currents. Um, this, the, this one is showing the, the currents near the seabed and this one is showing the currents near the water surface. Um, so these currents are generated by the waves that you see, but also by the wind. And in this case, summer condition with a, a typical uh, strong southeaster blowing. So you can see the surface currents are, are being blown um, towards the northwest. Um, the currents near the seabed are much less affected by the wind. You can see they're much less um, strong and they're actually flowing in quite a different direction. They're flowing almost northeasterly whereas the waves, the currents offshore are flowing northwesterly. That's actually the mechanism for upwelling. This term northeasterly current is what's bringing that cold water in. The surface is by the wind and the Coriolis force and the bottom water is then a cold, cold 10 degree bottom water is, is being sucked in along the seabed and, and bringing in the cold water. You can also see there are some rips. So in this case, there's actually an onshore current at at the at the at the Glen at Glen Beach here, and then there's a rip current flowing out through the center of Camps Bay. Okay, so that is uh, Camps Bay. 
The last example sort of in this in this vein um, is a, a study we did at St. Helena Island, which is the Atlantic Ocean. We designed this uh, wharf, which up to now, um, when the St. Helena, the HMS St. Helena used to go to, they used to have to uh, offload, transship the, all, the, all the goods um, you know, at sea because there was no port, no wharf. Um, so we have now built this wharf so they can actually import um, goods in a, in a much easier way. Um, but what's most interesting is, is we model, this is this bay, this is the 100 year wave condition coming in. This is the corresponding. And you can see we generated this rip current out in the, through the middle of the bay. Um, when we built the wharf, so this is what you can do with modeling because we did this obviously as part of the design process. When we added the wharf here, you can see it changes the waves, makes the waves much smaller. The whole point of the wharf is to provide shelter, a sheltered anchorage for the vessel, or sheltered mooring. So the waves become much smaller here, and you can see how the corresponding uh, rip currents or currents completely change. The effect of and and really what's happening here is you can see in the northern part of the bay the currents are about the same. They they're flowing southwards. But what, what's happening now, the waves are quite large over here. They're saying well, they're the same size over here. So the waves that are breaking are lifting up, raising the sea, the water level. On this side, in the shelter of the of the wharf, there's much smaller waves, much less breaking. So the water level is, is lower here. So all that happens is the water flows from high to low. And that's what. And then this rip current running out along the wharf. And this is a situation that you see um, as soon as you build a structure like this at Mono BC, for instance, where there's the groin, you then see a rip current generated up against that groin. And, and that it's caused by, by this process that I've mentioned. Maybe while we're on the rip currents, this is sort of the last plot of rip currents that I'm going to do. The, the rip currents that I've been showing you, I, I would describe as mega rips. So these are are quite large rip features caused by scale um, bathymetry features you know, of, of, the, of the particular location. What often concerns sea rescue are these smaller rip currents that are caused by short-term um, gullies in the, in the seabed. So where you get these rip cells formed, where you get deeper water, um, where the waves break on either side and then the water runs out through that rip and through that deeper channel. And, and those are, are caused on a sandy beach and it needs the, the seabed to actually change. We are able to, but the studies that I've shown, we just haven't, it wasn't really the focus of the study. You know, this particular study was to, to, to look at, these results were actually used to look at sedimentation and whether we would have to do dredging at the berth. That's why we were studying the currents here. We weren't actually trying to estimate rip currents because nobody swims here. So, so we can model these smaller scale rip currents. It's exactly the same processes, but just at the examples that I was pulling out up to uh, all the ones I've been showing you now, they tended to be these large scale rips, much smaller scale rip, which, which obviously do occur and are, are less predictable because they also depend on the seabed, the sand seabed changing. Um, okay, so I want to move on to tides. Um, the interesting thing about the tides in South Africa is is that if you go from you know from Port Nolith uh, all the way around to to Richards Bay, the time of high tide is is probably about within a half an hour, and so the the tides along the whole coastline are, are very similar, it's going up and down. Um, and, and this, this plot just gives you a, a background to why that is. And what this plot is showing is, is the, the M2 tidal constituent. M stands for moon and 2 stands for twice daily. So the moon is the dominant forcing of the tides. And because of the continents and various other things, the rotation of the Earth, the, the impact of the M2 tide on the Earth's tide actually looks like this. It's quite complicated. The colors are just showing the amplitude of the tide. So you can see their places. Amplitude is about half a meter and their places like Europe where the amplitude is three times higher than that. Um, the other thing here is these white lines are, are basically showing the time of high tide. 
So each white line is showing where the tide, the time of high tide is changing one hour later. And what you can see off South Africa, there's one white line here and the next white line is here off, off Mozambique. So there's only one hour tide difference, this huge distance. And that just explains again why our tides, our tide is not changing. If you look at in the English Channel here, those white lines are so close together, they're on top of each other. And, and, and that's, so their time of high tide would be changing dramatically along the coastline. And also the second impact of that is that it will cause strong tidal currents. And these are just tidal currents that will happen off the coast, not in an estuary or a river mouth, but they will occur just up and down the coastline. Um, and that, to, to get those currents, you need to have these, these white lines close to occur. They just simply aren't close together. So we don't really see strong currents offshore of our coastline due to tides. If you look at the, the Middle East, the Persian Gulf here, there actually are some white lines quite close together. And if we look at this simulation, this is Abu Dhabi, and their tidal range is about the same as ours, about one and a half meters. But because the tide is moving up and down the coast, um, the, we, they actually generate these currents. So red is, is high tide and blue, and the arrows are showing the currents. And you see, just as the tide goes up and down, because it's not only going up and down, it's also moving along the coastline. You generate currents offshore of the straight coastline, which we just don't get here. Okay. However, in South Africa, we do get um, strong tidal currents at the mouths of estuaries. So this is the, the Bushman's River estuary. Um, so this is the town of Bushman's. This is the town of Kenton-on-Sea. And this is a simulation of tidal currents um, at the estuary mouth. This is the, N2, the not the N2, but the, the bridge um, across the river towards on the way to Port Alfred. Um, so this diagram here is showing the tide. So you can see at the moment the tide is going out. So you can see that the currents are, are flowing outwards in this in this narrow tidal channel. Um, Again, the colors are showing. So purple means one meter per second, which is a really strong current. So you know we're at low tide, and now you can see the tide starts coming. Floods the coastal, the sandbanks here, and then flows upstream. Um, I wrote uh, here, tidal prism. The, the thing that, that impacts how strong these currents at the mouth are going to be is the tidal prism, which essentially is the volume of water that has to flow in and out of the estuary every tidal cycle, and that depends on the length of the estuary. So it, it turns out that Bushman's, I think, is the second longest tidal estuary in South Africa. With, so the tide is more than 20 kilometers up the estuary, and so that means that there's, there's a big volume of water that has to get exchanged every tidal cycle, and that explains why there's such strong currents um, in the mouth, and also explains why the mouth stays open. All the other estuaries along this coastline, okay, besides the, the Kariga, which is next door, all the other estuaries tend to close, cl the mouth closes off. And that's because it's shorter and there's much less water flowing in and out with the tide and the currents are not strong enough to actually scour the entrance and keep it clean or keep it open. Okay, so um, river mouths or estuary mouths. The other place we get strong currents in South Africa is in lagoons, specifically Neisner Lagoon and, and Langebaan Lagoon. So this is uh, Langebaan Lagoon, Saldana Bay, and it's a simulation showing the, the currents with the black arrows. Um, what we've also done is just um, uh, release a, a floating object into the model, which is shown by the, the red line, and just uh, the model is able to then predict the trajectory of that object. So you it in over here on the outgoing tide. If we start again, it flowed out and then the tide changed and it came back in again and it flowed out again, came back in again, and then eventually moved along. There's actually also a very strong southeaster blowing. So it actually ended up, this object ended up here. Two days later, it ended up at the ore jetty. So you can imagine that a simulation like this would be of use for a search and rescue um, operation. Okay, the next thing to talk about related to 
uh, essentially this this plot is showing the year is 1984. The, the, the top plot in blue is showing the, the tidal predictions for the whole year um, for 1984 from January to December. And essentially tides are very predictable. If we have a year's worth of measurements at any location in the, on Earth, we can do an analysis of it and we can use the analysis results to do a prediction of the tide for the next 100 years at that location. Um, that's all you need. And it's very predictable because it's completely and they are also very predictable. Um, but what you probably know is that the, the actual water level that you see on a particular day doesn't always correspond exactly to the predicted tide. Predicted tide. And that's shown here where the red line is showing the tide that is actually measured in Port Elizabeth Harbour over the year. And you can see it's underneath the blue tide. You can see it's sticking out. And the difference between the, the actual measured tide and the predicted tide is shown in the green line, which is plotted on the right-hand axis. So what you can see that most of the time, the, the actual water is within about 25 centimeters up or down of the predicted tide. So it's pretty close. Um, but now and then, particularly during storms, you can have quite a big difference. And we call this difference um, storm surge. And if we zoom in on the bottom plot, it's actually just showing this section over here, about 10 days during May 1984. And you may remember that is a, the, a, a, pretty much the biggest storm that's hit the sort of Cape Town um, ever, May 1984 storm. I remember it clearly, I was writing matric and we had didn't have power for about two weeks. And um, you can see what happened at Port Elizabeth here. Yeah, the predicted tide is shown in blue. And for about five days, the red, shows that the actual observations, the actual tide, the actual water level was up to 0.7 meters higher than the predicted tide. So typically these, these storm surges are 20, 30 centimeters higher, but on occasion they can get up to 0.70 centimeters higher than the predicted. And we call that storm surge. Um, and it's generally due to, to onshore winds and low pressure. So it often happens during storms because this, the frontal storms we have in South Africa generally are, have low pressures and have strong winds. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a way of run-up. So this is a simulation in, of a, this is a cross-section showing waves arriving at a beach. We've exaggerated the vertical, easier to see. Um, and what you can see here, the, the currents that we're seeing here that are plotted on this scale, these are not um, rip currents, these are not tidal currents, these are the actual orbital velocity currents. So these are the currents caused by the, you know, by the waves. So these would be changing every 14 seconds as the wave comes past. These are the currents that you'd experience. And you can see at breaking point here, these can get up to about three meters per second. And then, the, and then they run up the beach. Um, this picture is just a, a zoom in of the, the beach to show the waves running, breaking and then running up and down the beach. At the bottom plot, we're actually just showing the time series. The, the blue or the black line is showing the time series of the wave run up, which is how high the way the water level goes up and down the beach, the maximum water level that it reaches on the beach for every um, wave. And um, this line over here, you may not be able to see, but it's at, at about 1.5 meters is what the water level would have been without the waves. And the red line, which is about 0.7 meters higher, is the average water level in the surf zone. And we call that the wave setup. And that's the wave setup is actually what's driving the rip currents. So what it means is that because of the waves break uh, in the surf zone, the average water level is higher than the, than the water level away from the surf zone, where waves aren't breaking. And because of that elevated water level, the water has to flow from high to low. And that's essentially what drives the rip current. It's this wave setup. The other thing to mention is that you know the, the, these are the wave run-ups, which is the vertical level reached by the waves. And you can see these go up to, in this case, about four meters. But in South Africa, in a, in a decent storm, the wave run-up can be about five meters above the the normal tidal level. And, and so you can see that wave run-up is actually the biggest component. The, 
So the total the total water level that you're going to get on a beach or on a shoreline is the tide plus the storm surge plus the wave run up. And of those, the wave run up is actually the most important component. There's a little bit of a, a terminology um, issue is that, that a lot of people call what call wave run up storm surge. So the, the absolute some level that the waves run up here, people refer to that as storm surge. But technically, storm surge is what I mentioned in the previous slide. It's the effect of pressure and wind on the tidal level. And wave run up is this short term impact. Every wave has a wave run up and generally wave run up is more important than storm surge. OK. And then actually one of the reasons I, I got hold of, of actually the NSRI recently was I was just a little concerned about the way that the, the rip currents were being communicated to the public. And because there was there's often a, a press release done every spring tide and the press release mentioned a lot of good stuff, but it also it's also also um, seemed to link rip currents and spring tide. The outgoing spring tide. And I was just concerned that the public would would think that um, there wasn't a risk of rip currents except at spring tide. And I did a, some very simple calculations. I'm not going to have I don't have time to go through them. But essentially, if you calculate on a straight be on a beach, um, what the what the current is off during the outgoing tide, what is the current flowing away from the beach? It turns out that it's only about three millimeters a second. And the actual rip currents are about a meter per second. So that just shows that the, the, the effect of the tide in generating a current on the beach is very low. About 300 times less than the, the current due to the waves, due to the rip currents. So, um, and, and this, this exercise just shows that. I, I'm not saying that the, the tides don't impact rip currents at all, but they don't really impact them by creating a current directly. What they may do is, as the tidal level goes up and down, you could change the beach profile, or you could expose, you could change the, the water depth. And for instance, if there's a bar offshore and at low tide that the waves break on the bar, then you get a different kind of rip current formed. Whereas at high tide, the waves could break up on the top of the beach rather than on the bar, and you could get a rip current formed, you know, closer to the shoreline. So the, the water level itself can change the, the rip currents, but the tide going out does not really create a strong current. So that's the, the only point I wanted to make. And, and I think I have, I think the latest press release actually did, did actually, um, you know, um, mention that the, the rip currents can occur at any tide. So that's, that's great. Okay, so very briefly, just to show a tsunami out of interest, um, we, we, we've done quite a lot of work on tsunamis. Uh, this is the May, sorry, the December 2004 tsunami, which unfortunately killed uh, more than 200,000 people around the world. And th this is a simulation of that tsunami. So what happened is that the, there was an earthquake over here, which lifted up the water level and created a wave. And that wave then, as you can see here, it then propagated across the Indian Ocean and then basically ran up the beaches and, and caused flooding and, and damage. It took about 12 hours. Okay. And at Port Elizabeth, they actually measured about a two meter wave in Port Elizabeth. We were somewhat lucky that it wasn't, it wasn't high tide and it wasn't spring tide. So there wasn't a lot of damage in South Africa. But um, at Port Elizabeth, a, a, a car was actually that was, that was on the on the breakwater was actually picked up and, and pushed against a building. So the, the water completely flooded the breakwater. Okay, so that was tsunamis and very briefly oil spills. So we, we're doing a lot of oil spill studies. Drilling of South Africa at the moment. Luckily off, off the west coast of South Africa, the, the southeasterly winds tend to push the oil offshore. So there's a very low risk that the, the oil will actually reach the shoreline. and there's also a low risk there's going to be an oil spill in the first place, but um, what can happen is that there's a blowout. So that's what happened in the in the in the Gulf of Mexico, the Deepwater Horizon event, where there was a blowout on the bottom, 
and and the oil flowed. And this is actually a similar event to that that we simulated here. And you can see that luckily the oil kind of stays away from the shoreline. Okay, so the, just to conclude, um, I, I try to show, I think that the, the, the tidal currents in South Africa are weak, except in estuary miles and tidal lagoons. Um, the storm surge is caused by wind and pressure, and that results in the tidal levels exceeding the predicted tides by up to about 0.8 meters during a storm. Uh, wave run-up is during storms can reach about five meters above the so wave run-up is is a bigger process than than storm surge, um, and then it's wave breaking that raises the average water level in the surf zone, and that's what leads to rip currents. So if there are no waves and no rip currents, the bigger the waves, the the stronger the rip currents will be. On on a on a straight beach, you would also need to have a gully or or some feature developing in the in the seabed um, to also create a rip current. Um, and then these models that I've been talking about, I think they're quite useful to understand the waves and, and currents at, at certain beaches. We want to try to set up some, some research projects. And I think if you've got any idea beaches that you would like to be simulated, um, please let me know and we can we can try to set up a, a research project using the University of Stellenbosch master's students to, to study and model the, the rip currents at a particular beach. Um, once we understand happening at a particular beach, it would be possible to, do, to forecast when dangerous conditions are likely. So it may be at a certain beach only when a certain wave direction and a certain wave height uh, you know, are, are forecast that you would expect rip currents. So it, to actually forecast these conditions. And then I think the, the Saldana Bay example showed that you can do trajectory uh, prediction um, for search and rescue using these kind of models. And the last slide, I think, is um, is just what I suggested about the the press um, the press releases, the communication around rip currents, is that at, at spring tides, um, you know, alert the anglers and coastal hikers and beach users that there's going to be lower than lower tides and higher than normal high tides. Um, and alert bathers and anglers near estuary or lagoon mouths that they're going to be stronger than normal tidal currents. And then when we have large waves forecast, then alert bathers to rip currents, um, which can occur at any tide. And also alert all coastal users that in, if they're large waves, there's going to be larger than normal wave run-up. So I think, um, yeah, those were, those were just some of the suggestions from myself. And... Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. It's been very quiet out there, so I hope you've got some questions. Yeah, Stephen, we uh, are been listening very intently. Uh, I actually want to ask Andrew Ingram, head of drowning prevention. Uh, you got any comments, Andrew? Yeah, Stephen, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think that we can put together a list of, of beaches um, and, and see what you can model on it. Uh, what is very interesting is Plymouth University are working with a, a group um, of us from Cape Town, and they're going to be doing some rip modeling that will be able to forecast um, the stronger rips uh, probably early next year. Um, so I'll, I'll keep you in tune with that, and, um, and maybe you can have a look at some of our worst beaches. I see Terence has put in, in the comments there table view. Um, so Bloberg... Um, and then Lagoon Beach and in, in Table Bay are really awful. You've mentioned Monwa BC, uh, and then Strand Beach is the other one that is a, a drowning nightmare. Um, those are, are really the hot spots that, that we have. Um, on a kind of personal level, my rescue base is Buckhoven, and I can't tell you how often uh, we've responded to uh, a drowning in progress in the center of Camps Bay, very often a child, uh, and we get there too late and you then have to land up searching for the body uh, over a number of days. Uh, and more often than not, um, that body is found on a submerged reef off Glen Beach. So I, I don't know if you have models of Camps Bay uh, in different wind and, and wave conditions that um, could help us uh, and the police uh, divers look in the right place pretty quickly. Yes, uh, I mean that plot that I showed you was just a snapshot, and 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 we have modelled um, a much longer 
well, uh, we've moderated two, yeah, a few months in uh, summer conditions and a few months in winter conditions. And it is, it, there are some fairly constant features, but but otherwise, you know, under, and as the waves change and the water levels change, the, the currents change. Um, but you did see in that plot that I did show, um, there was kind of a onshore rip, an onshore current up against, up against the rocks of Glen Beach. Um, Flowing inward, so you know if we if we go back to that slide, um, but but again, you know, this this is quite this is just one snapshot, but not really the way to do it. But if you see over here, if if someone someone at this particular moment in time, which is it's a fairly typical summer condition. Um, got into trouble on this side of the swimming side of Camps Bay and got caught in that rip current, went out there, and then you can see it curves and then runs against the rocks and into the kelp there at Glen, off Glen Beach. So I don't know if that's what you're describing. Um, it might well be. Um, Glen Beach is interesting uh, because on the, the right-hand side, if you're facing the sea, so the Clifton side, uh, that's where it rips off the beach. So the, the surfers will often use that, that right-hand side to get out uh, and then surf in the middle um, back in. So uh, it, there's two sets of little reefs off, off Glen Beach, uh, and the, the rip current stops before the first one. So that onshore um, flow of water would uh, stop around, around the second one, and that's where they would meet up, I guess. Yes. Um... The, the model is actually a lot more detailed than this. We we just we're just showing a sort of overview. So if I could zoom, I can't zoom in right now, and we, but but it it may be that there is a yeah that there is a that 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 sort of block that, well that's joining the the one that I'm showing, um, and then also as uh, as uh, just a slight change in wave direction may may also you know change things a little bit as well, so. You know, this again. This study was not done for for rip currents. It was done for other reasons. Um, so we were focusing on 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 something else. But um, the, the model is available, and and we can probably get get permission to to use the results um, for something like you suggest. Uh, that would be absolutely amazing, and the um, the volunteers at Parkhoven uh, could certainly use that. Uh, and the city of Cape Town professional lifeguards uh, who are on the beach during lifeguarding season, uh, I think, would uh, be very interested in that. So maybe we can take it offline and I can chat to you um, later about how we can get those models and how we can use them. Um, and if you've done it in, in any other places where uh, our volunteers respond regularly to, to um, people caught in rips or drowning in progress, I mean, for instance, off the top of my head, Victoria Bay and Heralds Bay uh, in the George area mm. are absolute nightmares. Mm, mm. Yeah, so they, you know, they are bays, and and they th they then have these kind of mega mega rips. Um, it's not just a little channel in the middle of the beach. It's it's a mega rip that runs down one of the down one of the sides of the bay, and and th those are probably quite predictable. They they would just depend. Conditions. Um, you mentioned Lagoon Beach. I mean, is is that at the at the estuary mouth of the Dip River? Because you know, then you've got a situation of waves, and these you know that's an estuary. So that's a situation where you would get a, a strong tidal current on the outgoing tide, especially at spring tide, if people are swimming oh, in the in in the mouth. Or you're talking about Milnerton more, Milnerton um, Lighthouse. So, uh, yeah, my experience of that area is that it's uh, um, the tidal flow is kind of minimal. Um, it's actual rip currents. So I was down there today. We're putting pink buoys up in that in that area. So if you're at the Lagoon Beach Hotel um, and you walk through yes. ankle deep water towards um, that little island that has houses on uh, Woodbridge Island. Um, yes. Yeah, so from from where the um, lagoon enters the beach towards Lug uh, Woodbridge Island, there's a channel that runs parallel to the beach for 150 meters or so, and then it pulls out. So uh, kind of what happens there very often is um, mo mostly a child 
will suddenly find themselves out of their depths and they're pulled along the beach and then out. Um, uh, on the left-hand side of Lagoon Beach Hotel towards Woodstock Beach, there's a number of kind of standard rips that are much smaller that just pull out to sea. And that's probably the place where there are most drownings in that area. Very um, small rips, short distance out, but for a weak swimmer, um, they're deadly. Yes, yes. I mean, in the mouth itself of, of the Dip River at spring tide, um, there should be fairly strong currents. Um, that that is that is almost you know the only place in Cape Town where there would be some sort of you know would be these these tidal currents. Um, but I think that that rip that that gully you're talking about also is sometimes almost the the river mouth. The the the, the river creates like a gully and then it migrates up the beach. So it's a, it's a sort of some sometimes it's caused by the river itself. Um, the 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 cut of the river the river, the river actually a little bit up the beach and creates that gully that you're talking about. Um, that's, yeah. Sometimes you see that anyway at that location. It's fascinating to look on Google Earth um, because you can actually see those gullies that are in the same place almost all the time. Nordhook um, is the other one. Um, yeah. The rips that run close to the hook and then move down towards the wreck in the center of the beach, um, they seem to say, stay in the same place. And because you can look down from Chapman's Peak, um, they, they're very obvious. Um, but you know, as I say, maybe if, if I could give you a, a list of beaches that are the, the highest drowning um, areas or the biggest dangers to, to lifeguards and, and the unguarded beaches, uh, we could put some kind of um, prediction together. And if there's Stellenbosch University students who would be able to do that, amazing. Yeah, no, I have been talking to the guys at, at the the course, the co coordinators of, of that course, yes. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Andrew. If there's anybody else that perhaps has a question, you can put your hands up now. We're heading into the last sort of two or three minutes. Um, but while there aren't any hands up, maybe a little bit a little bit about uh, Neisner, Stephen. Um, what happens um, there? It gets pretty interesting. Yes, um, we haven't we haven't done a, a lot a lot of work in Neisner, so I can't talk about the the results. But you know, obviously, what's happening there is that there is a, a strong tidal current, and there is a big swell. So you you're getting the the waves interacting with the current, and on the outgoing tide, it obviously makes the the waves much steeper, and and. You know, it's almost the same effect that you're getting out in the Gullis Current, where the Gullis Current is flowing southwards and the waves are, are moving northwards, and then you get these freak waves that are are, are, are basically um, breaking the whole the, the bow of, a, of, of the ships. Um, so it's the same sort of effect. You get these very steep waves, and, and you can then get almost like a freak wave when you have a strong current opposing the, the waves. Fantastic. All right, uh, Stephen, I think that's it for the evening. Um, yes, I, um, this is Corbis of Strongfontein. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we got um, about two rips that's always here because we're close to a rip now. Um, this weekend past, it was like uh, the actual rip was especially very strong, so it sucked out and it caused like a, along the beach we had a channel. And yeah, um, that one part was like we had like the whole channel of the sandbank was um, sucked away because of that one rip. So, yes. that's our uh, most dangerous area on the beach. Is that near the tidal pool or not? Um, yeah, yeah. The, um, and then the other rip we have is by the the, the slip that the surfer used to go out used to go out, uh, um, but um, sometimes it changed and it takes him around, and then I must go out straight and then come back in. 
So those are two um, dangerous areas over here in, in Strandfontein. Even though he's talking about Strandfontein um, up near Lambert's Bay on the west coast. Oh, uh, okay, not Strandfontein in, in False Bay. No, not that one, no. Okay, yes, yeah. I, I'm not familiar with that. The Strandfontein and um, Fred and all. Um, okay, yeah. Ragnar's and Lambert's Bay, Fawn Bay. Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, so I think the, the, the rips that are in bays, you know, like Victoria Bay, which is is rocky, a rocky bay on the sides, they, they're much more predictable. These ones that form on a straight beach, um, you know, even even, even Nordic Beach, um, there's there's rip cells that you see that there's that we call them mega cusps. That you see a few hundred meters long, um, maybe 500 meters long, and then the next one. They probably move a little bit. They're not absolutely still, and, and they're much more complicated because there, there's an interaction between what I've been showing you is an interaction between the waves and the currents. But there, you've got an interaction between the waves and the currents and the sand, and so it's a it's a much more dynamic system. If if it, it can, the sand gullies can migrate, and and the one day there can be a rip here, and the next day there can be a rip um, some. So, so it, it's really more challenging to predict rips um, on a sandy on a on a sandy beach, um, where, on a straight sandy beach rather than a, a beach that's you know got a, a, a rocks on either side that are actually holding it in a in a more stationary position. But it, so it, you would never be able to predict exactly where it's going to be, but you would still be able to pre perhaps predict you know days when there's a higher risk of 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 a rip happening. Yes, because sometimes we had like two can pass, we had two, two rips. And before that, we had three. So, um, and, um, yeah. so the one area, where I had a chance to swim. And um, so when it did my opening, I died. Between, between, in, the, in that time, the one rip was like, I can say, a rub of water sucking back out. And I was, Please, I don't have my cyber rescue because that rope was going up by 800 meters if it wasn't further. Cool. Kervis, thanks very much. Um, as we close off, Lurt, I think you had your hand up for the very, very last question, and then we'll be uh, closing off after that. Lurt, uh, you want to go online quick? Yeah, Stephen, um, yeah, thanks a lot for your, for your master class. Um, yeah, just one thing. Right? At our slipway at Storms River Mel, um, we've been asked by Parks to assist in coming up with a solution um, to make it safer. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, if there's somebody that can assist us in, you know, in using the model or the modeling or getting you guys in touch with Parks to try and see if we can assist them. Um, you got a very strong current um, on the slipway that either slaps the trailer completely off the slipway and the vessel or <laughs> when you come in normally um, either your trailer is completely dry and then the next moment you need to come in with a wave and then your vehicle is flooded um, and that's basically the only way of getting your boats on the trailer so yeah thanks a lot and, and knowing that this type of Modeling is available. Um, it will definitely help to sort out issues like that. Yes. Um, yeah. We, I mean, we we definitely um, design slipways, and um, maybe just very briefly. I mean, I, I think if anyone's familiar with the the slipways now at Estefontein, that's a, a sort of example of an unintended consequence. Is that they, they built that sort of inner harbour, and there's two slipways, and the one that's sort of um, near the entrance to the to the, the little port, the, the mini port, that is on what we call a node. So what you see there is that the, you've got a very strong current there. So you launch you launch on that slipway, and the current is going from left to right across the slipway. And but the water level is not up and down very much. You just and if you use the the slipway, that's um, at the top of that harbor, on the west side, 
there the water level is going up and down, but there isn't a strong current because that's on what we what we call an anti-node. Uh, you can either choose to whether have a, a, a variation in your water level or to have a strong cross current. And you, when the bagel is running, you, you choose one, two. And it, it, should have been, it should be possible to actually put it in a, in a, a better place and design the slipware properly. But you know, it's not always, there's not always enough thought put into it or, or budget available to kind of just, just check these things before they're actually built. So I'm not sure exactly what's happening at Storms River, but um, but if there, you know, it sounds like there's currents and there's also waves, um, storm sur uh, surges coming up and down. So it it may need a, a change in location, or it may need a, a small breakwater or or, or, or sort of a wave wall just to to provide more protection. But we can definitely, if you contact me, we could um, we could have a look at that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Stephen, I'll attest to launching at Azimutain. It certainly is a challenge most of the time. <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. But Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, this has been very informative. I've actually been, I've learned a hell of a lot this evening. Thank you. And uh, we'll be ending the recording and good night to everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you.